Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yogi Rath Sargam, and uh, I work at Carbon Cure Technologies, but the work that I'm going to present today is uh, uh, the work that I did during my master's at Iowa State University uh, with Dr. Kajin Wang. And uh, the topic of my presentation, uh, which is very relevant to this uh, session, is experimental measurement and prediction modeling of thermal conductivity of concrete. And uh, before I start, I would like to thank the previous speakers because uh, uh, for introducing all these electrical and thermal uh, properties or, and their importance in concrete. So my, uh, uh, this work was actually focused on how we can measure conductivity experimentally on using uh, concrete specimens that we uh, make, like the cylinders that we make in lab, and then also using machine learning algorithms to predict that conductivity. Um, here is a background as to what is thermal conductivity. Um, I, I think it is already introduced, but uh, just as a, a background, uh, this is actually the ability of the material to conduct heat. And uh, mathematically, it is defined as uh, the constant of proportionality, the K value over there, uh, between the heat flux and the temperature gradient. Um, and why it is important for concrete and what are its applications? Um, for example, in nuclear power stations, they need concrete of low thermal conductivity to provide thermal insulation. Um, we have seen in heated pavements or heated driveways where they have heaters or even concrete uh, would need uh, to have high, high thermal conductivity so that the heat is uh, trans transferred uh, faster. And then in, in mass concrete op applications also this uh, is relevant because uh, so that if we know the conductivity of concrete, we can predict the temperature profile of mass concrete as to how uh, the heat or uh, is going to be dissipated uh, so that the cracking ability of uh, the mass concrete can be predicted in advance and relevant measures can be taken there. So that's just a background of uh, the thermal conductivity. And uh, as I said, this study was divided into two parts. One was the experimental measure measurement and the prediction modeling. So I will first talk about the uh, experimental measurement part here, where the objective was uh, to look at how the different materials that we use in concrete today uh, would affect the conductivity, the thermal conductivity of concrete. And the parameters that we looked at was water binder ratio, the age of concrete, uh, the types of aggregate, which does have an impact, uh, starting with the normal aggregates that we use, lightweight aggregates that we're also using recycled concrete aggregates these days, the SCMs that we use, the flash, slag, um, and then the fibers, the steel fibers, the polypropylene fibers, how would they impact um, the concrete thermal conductivity. Uh, highlight of this study was also this uh, very simple test method that was developed at uh, Arizona State, actually. Uh, we use that method, which uh, actually you can do prepare a, a concrete cylinder, uh, same way as we prepare for uh, testing the compressive strength. But uh, there is a rod that goes inside. Uh, and uh, while casting, you have this rod uh, holding. and it, it is kind of a hole going through out the cylinder from top to bottom. And uh, how the test setup looks like is, uh, so there is a heater that would go inside that hole that, uh, that was created while casting the cylinder. And along with that heater, there will be two sensors, one at the top of the specimen, as we see on the top, and one at the, at the bottom, so that it measures the heat uh, inside that other hole that is there. And there are sensors, the thermocouple sensors, on the surface of the specimen, as we can see uh, in the picture over here. Um, and it is connected to power source, uh, so heater is heated, and it, the, the heat that is created in the center would be then dissipating, uh, which is what we're measuring on the surface. So we're measuring in the center and on the surface with time. And uh, when it reaches uh, the steady state, that's when you stop uh, this test. Uh, it takes around three to four hours to reach steady state. And uh, based on uh, those constant of proportionality, uh, based on the dimension of the cylinder and the heat uh, flux, temperature gradient, uh, we calculate the thermal conductivity. So it can be just done uh, using uh, concrete cylinders that we usually make uh, in lab. So these uh, measurements were done on uh, different samples looking at the effect of various parameters that we talked about. Um, <laughs> Just going to share those results now. Uh, this is the effect of water binder ratio. So uh, four water binder ratio concrete were, was prepared, uh, starting with 0.35 water cement water binder ratio, 2.55. And as we can see, as 
the water binder ratio is increased, the conductivity reduces, uh, which is what would be expected because with an increase in water binder ratio, there is a corresponding decrease in, uh, in, in the uh, dry density of material. Um, and usually con conductivity is directly related to the density, dry density of the material of concrete. So, and also it affects increasing water binder ratio would uh, actually in result in increase in porosity. So uh, that's why we see this decrease in, uh, in conductivity here. The next parameter that we looked at was uh, the effect of SCMs, the supplementary cementitious material. So there were four, uh, including a reference batch, there was five concrete batches that were prepared with 20% uh, fly ash, 45% fly ash, and then fly ash and slag were mixed together into 20 fly ash, 20 slag, and 20 and 30 uh, slag. Um, we do see a decrease here as well, but it's not, not very significant um, from 1.2 to it goes to 1.1 at 50% uh, SEM replacement. Um, and that is probably because uh, the slag and fly ash has uh, slightly lower conductivity uh, and we're using up to 50% uh, uh, replacement, so there is a decrease, uh, but it's not, not very significant that we see because of the use of SCMs here. The next parameter we looked at was age of concrete, uh, starting with the very early age, three day, um, up until 56 day, and there was a different effect that we saw, like from three day to seven day, we see a reduction in conductivity, but then from seven to 28 day, it increases after which it just uh, becomes more or less constant. Um, Reasons uh, are actually unknown, um, but could be because of uh, the changes that happens, the water activity changes that would happen at early age might be impacting uh, the conductivity that we see. And after that, because there is not much of a change in hydration after 28 days, so we don't see uh, much change happening in conductivity as well. Um, we looked at fiber, steel fiber and polypropylene fiber. Um, polypropylene fiber is not a conductive material, so we don't see much of a change in conductivity because of the use of that up to 2% by volume of concrete. And, but the steel fiber, which is uh, more conductive, we do see an increase, but that happens only after 0.5% volume fraction. Again, going back to those concepts of uh, percolation threshold. So probably that is 0.5% is the percolation threshold here for um, thermal conductivity. We looked at the aggregates, the effect of aggregates, the lightweight aggregates um, uh, with 50% replacement and 100% replacement, and now we see uh, good conductivity reduction. Uh, again, lightweight material uh, reducing, reducing the density of uh, concrete, so there is a decrease that would be expected. Um, and then the recycled concrete aggregates as well, are starting with 30% replacement of normal aggregates up to 100%. Uh, there is a reduction that we see. So all these factors do have an impact, as we can see uh, experimentally here. Uh, this is just a summary of uh, all those factors that we looked at, the age of concrete. The SEM replacement uh, has actually reduces uh, the conductivity. Um, the fiber volume fraction, as we saw, polypropylene didn't have much impact, but then steel uh, did increase by under percolation threshold, the conductivity of concrete. Uh, aggregates, the lightweight, and the RCA, uh, because, yeah, they're reducing the density of concrete there, so there was a reduction in conductivity and water binder ratio did have a reduction effect. So this is just a summary of all the experimental uh, results. The next part was uh, the prediction modeling, um, where, again, a background here is that there are some models that exist in literature, uh, the empirical models based on, uh, and most of them are actually based on the dry density of concrete. So as we can see, these equations over here are, uh, pr can predict uh, the conductivity just based on the density. It's not considering all other factors. Density is an important factor, but there is, and these models were actually developed using very old models which were developed using uh, uh, the old materials that were used, the SCMs were not, all the SCMs that we use today, the fibers and other materials that we're using were not included. So the objective of uh, this study was actually to use, uh, to develop a data set first, data set, and then use machine learning algorithms to uh, develop this prediction <laughs> model where we can use that to, to predict the conductivity of concrete. So here's just a flow chart of how the model was developed. First step is to develop a database which is needed to train the model. 
which was done using uh, literature values, the recent ones, not the old ones. Um, but then a drawback or the limitation of uh, getting data from literature is that you, you don't get all the data that you need corresponding to all the parameters or the variables that you would want to. Um, so then we have to pre-process data where the missing data has to be uh, imputed. So I use some imputation algorithms uh, to uh, replace that missing data with similar data set. Um, and then data normalization, the performance measures that are used are generally the R square values, the mean absolute error, and then root mean square errors. Um, and then different algorithms were also evaluated on the data set, function-based, tree-based, ensemble, uh, learning-based. Um, and based on that, one model was selected, which was further uh, actually used to select features. So it was further refined uh, to improve uh, the prediction um, um, to reduce the error or improve uh, the accuracy of the model. And lastly, the model was tested not just on uh, the training data set, uh, because yeah, if you just uh, in evaluate the model on training data set or validation data set, we always get high uh, accuracy. But then the data set that was developed using previous study, experimental study, was actually used, which was not part of model development. Oh, it, so the model that was developed was tested on this independent uh, data set too. Um, so yeah, this is just a snapshot of the database that was developed using literature data uh, for the past like 15 years of literature. Uh, 213 data points, 13 variables, uh, including different categories of variables, the mix variables, the test variables, the categorical variables. So try to include all parameters, all variables that was possible. And then as I said, the independent test set which was developed from the previous lab study was used to test this. Uh, just showing how, like when the data was collected, how try to plot those as to uh, look at the trends of uh, different variables like changing the type of fine aggregate or the co type of coarse aggregate, the fiber type, how like from the literature data, what's the trend that we see. And then this was used to train algorithms, uh, as I said, from different categories, the function-based al algorithms, the linear regression, uh, artificial neural network, support vector uh, machine, and um, on different data sets. Uh, as I earlier told that uh, we had to do, because there was a lot of missing data from literature, uh, so we used different curing or imputation methods. Naive curing, there's one uh, FHDI curing methods. And try to evaluate all these algorithms, out of which uh, the one, the ANN actually provided better performance. And uh, the cured, cured data set was the FHDI cured. So that was selected uh, from um, this performance for further uh, improvement of, of, the, uh, of the model. Um, and next step on there was actually to select which variables we should be uh, selecting for further uh, refinement. Uh, so as try to look at all the variables selected uh, in different categories using different algorithms, again, of, of variable selection. And uh, this, is, this chart here is just an example of one of the algorithms which gives us the relative importance of the variables that was in the model to uh, prediction of thermal conductivity. So like, as we can see, density, of course, uh, is, has the highest importance here to prediction of K. Then there are other variables also, the type of uh, fine aggregate, the weight of coarse aggregate, and up until uh, the SM. But what this also shows is fiber weight is not as important as it was shown in uh, the uh, the experimental measurement, although, I mean, there was change, but it was not significant, and it's not as important to predict the thermal conductivity. But there are other parameters. So out of these uh, different categories of variables, um, the, again, I mean, all those different categories were then used to train model and look at their performance on all those three different data sets, the training set, the validation set, and the test set. Uh, and number four, which is what was present, that this state was out of these nine parameters were selected to further refine the model. And uh, then finally, the model was defined, and this is uh, the performance that uh, was obtained on the different data set, the training set, which was 80% of the total uh, 213 data points. The validation set is the rest, 20% of that data. 
and then uh, the test set is independent test set from the last uh, experimental study. Um, as we can see, performance-wise, um, the training set, obviously, because this is the data that was used to train, we always get very high, good performance, uh, good accuracy, um, 0.96 of R squared. Then validation set is 0.9, but then on the independent test set, it's not as good as it would be on the other two sets. It's 0.6 R squared, but um, it can further be refined, of course, with, uh, with more data, bigger data set. Uh, but more or less like this did a decent job there of uh, actually predicting somewhat in that range uh, of um, the thermal conductivity that would be expected there. Um, and then, again, how can this model that is developed can be used? Uh, as I started with uh, uh, talking about the applications of this conductivity uh, in mass concrete, so what I did then was use this developed model to predict the conductivity of concrete with different types of fine aggregate, uh, different mineralogy of fine aggregate and coarse aggregate. So that chart over there is predicted values. Uh, for example, if there is, let's say, lightweight uh, fine aggre coarse aggregate and then quad sand fine aggregate, what would be the conductivity of material? And then using those different combinations of coarse aggregate and fine aggregate, if we use that into, let's say, a mass concrete member, how would that affect the temperature profile of mass concrete uh, starting with early age up to, let's say, 15 days? So as we can see, this is uh, the temperature profile that would be uh, expected in a mass concrete and how increasing thermal conductivity, which is increasing by, let's say, 40% thermal conductivity, is actually changing uh, the temperature by more than 20, 25 degrees Celsius. That can have a huge impact in uh, the cracking uh, resistance of a mass concrete member. Um, this is just like thermal conductivity. Um, so yeah, I would like to conclude here that uh, from experimental measure the measurement, the first part, uh, that's a simple method using concrete cylinder, uh, the conductivity can be measured. Um, and it just requires those uh, thermocouples and a heater to measure uh, the conductivity. And we looked at those uh, parameters, which I already explained. Uh, most of them actually reduces the conductivity. It's just that steel fiber volume above a percolation threshold would increase the conductivity. Uh, and the prediction model, um, again, can be used for various uh, purposes. There's a missing data imputation method also, which is important if you're trying to develop a prediction model based on literature data. Um, so it is also presented. and. Uh, the model that was developed, um, as I already told, that uh, training and validation set had low errors, but on test sets, slightly higher error, uh, still does a decent job there. And uh, yeah, this model can be applicable for different case studies here. So yeah, thank you.